Can I play you the beginning of the first little thing? Sure. Know. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you can see if you recognize it. Nine o'clock on a Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Regular crowd stumbles in. Yeah, that's good. Mm, that's good. I learned that, and then I learned. Uh, I just started. I'm trying to learn how to play, so I started trying to learn to blues, do some blues, and doing the. You know, do that kind of stuff. But that's harder for me to do. That's really hard. I, I always thought you just blew into them. But, it's a lot more than that. Isn't but, it? Yeah, and you know, one thing that it's really doing for me is uh, it's improving my. My breathing. Oh, good. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. You have to learn to like cycle breathe through your nose while you're doing it. Yeah. And take breaths now. Too. And I learned some other ones, but I I tried to play Amazing Grace. Oh. I don't know if you know this, but harmonicas they're in one key oh. unless you buy a you know one that's crazy that you can. Yeah. And some of them will have a slider so you can change the key. Oh. Yeah. But they're all they're all in, in individual keys. So I got a deal. These are Honer. And they're, this is an old one. But I got a bunch of Honer harmonicas, I think 10 of them. And they're good ones. They're all old German. And I think I want to say I paid like $50 for yeah. all of them, plus a really nice case. Yeah. And I cool. think that's because a lot of young people, they don't go after bluegrass and other instruments like that. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I was playing through all of them. And I was like, I can't play Amazing Grace. There's a note missed. Uh -huh. And then I read and I realized, yeah, you can't play Amazing Grace unless you have a 12 hole. So I just found two old, a 12 and a 14 on eBay. Oh no, on uh, Facebook, got them for $14 for oh, shipping. Yeah, the monocles for Christmas. Did they? Play around with oh, them. How are you doing with it? He's not, they just, they just like to mainly just play. Yeah, that's okay. That's how you get started. You know how I, how I learned to play guitar? I, I can't read sheet music or anything like that. How I learned to play guitar, Ben, is I had an acoustic guitar at the house as a kid. Mm -hmm. And the first, I said, dum, 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 you know, playing an Iron Man, you know? Yeah. And once I figured out some notes, yeah. then I was like, ooh, this is, oh, that sounds like that in that song. And then I just developed an ear. So when I hear the music, I can just start playing it. Yeah, I bet he'd be able to. Oh, yeah. He's, He's got a good I'll voice, but he should learn an accompanying like instrument like the piano. Yeah. Yeah. We've had piano lessons for a while. We're starting and again. We're going to try with Marlene work um, in the fall. I think piano, yeah, if I had it to do over again, I would have tried to learn piano. Yeah, it's a bass instrument where you can learn all other instruments. Yeah. Hey, it's the one to master. Okay. <laughs> and it's so easy to, uh, you know, when, when you can play piano. Yeah. Mm. You can be anywhere. This There's a piano there. You can sit down and have a good yeah. time, but it's, you know, the, the playing is the hard part. Yeah. yeah. Did you, <laughs> did you, uh, yeah, you was know, when you were No, I played the violin, the did viola, and the cello. Really? Uh, yeah, from third grade, all the way to the just like grade school, school, everything. Oh, and did you, you play any instruments in school? I played the clarinet, and then I learned still learning uh, piano. I, I started practice, learning it in the seminary. So I figured it would be a helpful. Anniversary gift to my piano lesson for birthday gift or something. Yeah, maybe it was a birthday was gift. Birthday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or well. Yeah. Uh, not that I've had a lot of time lately to no. practice that. But. I can play like Jerry Lee Lewis. I just like, yeah. turn around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or Jerry. Yeah, Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah, yeah you're right. Something. Think about that stuff, and I think as a kid, like all, everybody in my family, like Jerry Lewis. You know, think about that, and you go, okay, and you, you look back, and you go, you married a thirteen-year-old girl. That's what happened? Is yeah, that sort of thing. And everybody loved him, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then last night I was listening to some music before I went to bed. I was playing some Kenny Rogers and I was listening to Ruby. Don't take your love to town. I don't know if you heard that. He says uh, it's about a guy who goes to Vietnam and ends up paralyzed with a little beast. And his wife is losing affection. So she's stepping out and he says, uh, Ruby, if I could, I'd get and I was like, oh, so Kenny, come on, the, gambler, you, know, you just yeah. got wrong. Start listening to the lyrics, you're like, oh. But you listen back to those old lyrics oh, no. from that time. And I remember, like, the Jerry Lee Lewis story was on television all the time. Mm. And it 
sure that where he had he was before. Yeah. And I'm thinking like, wow, I don't know that there was, there were some things in them that weren't very good in our system. Yeah, maybe how, maybe it's how it's said too. It's okay. less, less threatening. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, is that I say this, I certainly understand how one person can get angry with another person. Right. Or rash. And maybe you may really not like them much at all. Yeah. But you never do. <laughs> oh, I know. Like, yeah. Oh, uh, extreme, my man. After this, I'll show you a video of our sonatical president playing banjo oh, okay. at the yeah, district convention. Yeah. I so. tried to play banjo. I, I played mandolin. Yeah, okay. I mandolin. So when I was in undergraduate school for nursing, I, me and another friend of mine was in school, and then my nephew, we had a three piece band and down in Olney, and we called ourselves this trio. Mm. And so every week, I would, you know, we played and make a flyer. We played at this coffee shop in town, pack it out. And we, but we did some bluegrassy type stuff. Yeah. We, did, we would go into nursing homes and play and stuff. Um, but we also did a bunch of stuff like old, like the Pogues, like Irish songs. Mm -hmm. and sure. Man, you don't meet every day and all that stuff like that. But it was fantastic. I could play the mandolin. It wasn't that the only thing that was difficult about it was that the fretboard is so small. Yeah. And you can over, you know, you can fret others and play guitar. But I wanted to play the banjo, but that's not too. He's a uh, he's very good. Um, so it's cool. Yeah, I'd like to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Now does he play like like bluegrass? He yeah, he does. Song? Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he. He can pick pretty well on the banjo. Cool. So, yeah. yeah, I'm impressed with people that are good at that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I, I guess we'll begin. It's it's uh, past eleven. I figured it would be a smaller group because uh, it's not as spicy as the topic. I guess. So, I mean, this one and uh, the next uh, Thursday are lighter, lighter topics. Um, lighter in the sense that. Um, you know the various opinions and if you if you had a chance to google um enoch especially enoch um and elijah and what does it mean that they were you know brought up to heaven and they didn't die uh there's a variety of opinions some of them are pretty crazy um uh, just like anything on the internet and um but it's not a it's not a question of salvation you know it's not um really and we'll see at the end of this it's it's really just um I would say it's a message of comfort and assurance, uh, which would be fitting for God to give that message to his people. Um, and then next Thursday, we'll talk about, uh, did Mary have children uh, after the birth of Jesus? So, and I'll give you a hint, I would say no. And so would the majority of Christian history and the Bible, but uh, modern Christian thought is uh, that she did. And uh, we'll dive into where that comes from, and, and we'll, I'll present both sort of sides. Does it really make a difference for, for anything? Not really. Not really. Um, but, uh, but yeah, lighter topics. And then in August, uh, we'll get into the heavy stuff um, of gender and sexuality and what scripture says, and really uh, Christian identity um yeah you're here can you can you go over that i know you're gonna be on trial after. right yeah i know this is a black bar over our voices <laughs> or... <laughs> this will be the video that they'll show <laughs> when, they, the when they bring me up on charges and um uh but i mean while well, you say that and and it was true actually in the finnish lutheran church so not the finnish state church if you know anything about scandinavia and i guess you'd call finland scandinavia too they're more Slavic, I think, than anything. But the the those churches up there in Scandinavia, the state churches, which started out very Lutheran, are actually now probably not Lutheran at all. I don't know if you could even call them Christian. And but they they've had these breakoffs that we're in fellowship with um, that retained their Lutheran identity and their Christian identity, I would say. Uh, but in the Finnish church, the the Lutheran bishop. Of the Finnish church that we're in fellowship with, I mean, he he was brought to trial for a biblical teaching of gender and sexuality because it is illegal there, um, and so because again, you you have a group of people that try to control the narrative um, and suppress the truth, and so um, 
so yeah, I mean, it, it is a real thing. You know, will it come to this country one day? Who knows? Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I mean, when you talk about what's hate speech, um, that could be pretty broad. And that's what happened. And in, in, now he went to trial and was found not guilty, along with one of their uh, members of parliament um, in, the, in, in Finland. Uh, but um, it was certainly a real, um, real, probably first example of, you know, the, the modern Western church prosecute or the, the country's prosecuting uh, someone for hate speech, teaching what, what the Bible teaches. So, um, so yeah, you know, I'm sure it'll be interesting and try not, I'll try not to be inflammatory uh, or at least intentionally inflammatory, I guess is the right thing to say. But, uh, but today we'll talk about Enoch and Elijah. There's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, and uh, we'll begin with the word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you provide your word to guide us, to reveal your son, Jesus Christ, the fullness of your revelation revealed in him. And by faith, you place us in your heavenly abode, the promise of the resurrection of, of eternal life, a promise to be with you now and forever. Uh, by faith in your word given word in baptism and in your holy supper and in your word made flesh in Jesus Christ. Lord, bless us as we study our topic today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So uh, Enoch is probably one of the more mysterious figures in scripture. Um, and uh, Enoch and Elijah are the only two people and recorded uh, human history or in scripture, right, uh, to go to heaven without dying. Now, uh, I've kind of showed my hand in what I'm thinking because if you Google this, some people say, oh, they didn't die or they did die or they went to heaven or they didn't go to heaven. And they try to do some gymnastics about uh, trying to explain, you know, what heaven scripture is talking about. Um, and uh, I'll show you hopefully that. Uh, it's pretty clear in scripture, maybe clear as mud, but clear that, um, you know, they both did not die, but were assumed into heaven um, and the heaven, which is the abode of God, where God dwells, right? Not in some kind of like sky or space, uh, uh, which is what some folks argue with. Um, and then we'll talk about um, uh, John chapter three, verse uh, 14, no, 13, which is the sort of contradicts that. Some people would say that uh, when Jesus talks about no one has ascended to the Father unless they descended from him, they, no one has ascended into heaven unless they descended. And I'll give the context for that because sometimes that's used as a contradiction to show that there's, there's a problem here in scripture, which it's not. Uh, but what does scripture say about Enoch? Well, <laughs> We get it from really two portions of scripture, Genesis chapter five. Um, and I've got it recorded here. Uh, when Jared lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were uh, 962 and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he'd followed Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Uh, thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And then when you go to Hebrews chapter 11, these heroes of the faith that the author of Hebrews uh, puts forth, um, chapter 11, verse 5 and 6, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, um, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased to God, and without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Um, and then, well, I guess, yeah, Jude Jude doesn't have any chapters. It's only one chapter. Verses 14 through 16, it talks about Enoch as well. Um, and this is probably the spiciest of the scripture verses when you when it gives reference to Enoch. 
So Jude says, it was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are the grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires, um, that uh, they are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. So, have you read that book? The Book of Enoch? Yeah, yeah some of it. Um, and we'll talk about the, well, we'll talk about Enoch. There are actually three books that are attributed to him, but uh, the, the main thing, the first Book of Enoch, we'll talk about that. Um, it, it's, it's weird. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it is. So, um, and we'll talk about whether it's scripture or not. Um, and I, I mean, I have, I have a Lutheran apocrypha, right? So our publishing house for, for Concordia publishing house puts out a, uh, an apocrypha, you know, hidden scriptures that are uh, written in this intertestamental period uh, between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament in the incarnation of Jesus. And so um, it's not included in our Lutheran American Bible or most American Bibles. It's usually attributed to, to Roman Catholics to have an apocrypha. But uh, Luther, uh, in his German translation of the Bible, included the Apocrypha. And, and, um, and there are actually a few references to Apocryphal text, Maccabees and Tobit, um, that our confessions make as well. Um, and sometimes uh, it'll come up in the introit for the divine service in the calendar that we follow. And um, if you look in our, it's in our bulletin, but it's also in... Um, yeah, it's in the altar book as well. Uh, usually we, we sing a psalm, right? We chant a psalm. Sometimes it says liturgical text. When it says liturgical text, that's a cop-out way of us saying that it's from the Apocrypha. Um, so, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, although the book of Enoch, first Enoch is not in this Apocrypha. Um, and there's some reasons why. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't think it's in the Roman Catholic one. The, the Roman Catholics have the Apocrypha in their canon of scripture. Um, these extra texts, along with Eastern Orthodox, they have a, a lot more extra texts. Um, and they, the Roman Catholic Church really codified that in the Council of Trent. So it wasn't really generally understood that those were going to be accepted Christian uh, scriptures before that. Yeah. Pastor, I, I had read that the... the the Orthodox Church. Yes. Theory. Do you think, I mean, is that, would it be, I heard that that was kind of probably the most complete of all those. Right. That's where the fullness of Enoch is, is written, in, written in their own language. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And so they would include that on there. I, I would include them as Orthodox, um, but but that's usually where it is. There's also Slavic Church has some, so we'll talk about that. I don't want to get too far ahead. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I think the key takeaway here, when you talk about scripture, and um, and Enoch is really found in Hebrews chapter 11 uh, by faith, right? By faith and without faith, it is impossible to please God. It fits in those heroes of the faith that um, Enoch, just like all those who came before, the patriarchs, when you talk about Adam and Seth, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, by faith, they were made righteous. Faith in what? Faith in the promised Messiah to come, right? In the seed of the woman that would crush the serpent's head. And so, especially for Enoch, who um, is in what we would call antiquity in the past, very far, far past, in a pre-flood destruct earth, you know, um, he would be very close to that promise given um, in uh, right after the fall. Uh, to Adam and Eve, um, and a promise renewed also in the death of Abel, right? So Abel gets killed by Cain, um, and if you look in Genesis chapter 4, Abel gets killed by uh, uh, Cain, and then Cain fathers a bunch of people as well. It gives their names, one of which is named Enoch, and founds a city called Enoch, that's not the same Enoch, and uh, I guess it was a popular name back then. And uh, then we had before. right. So then you have 
the seventh from Adam um, in the line of Adam is the is the Enoch that comes from Seth, right? So after Abel is killed, God continues his promise to say that they will be born a Messiah from the line of, you know, Adam and Eve, and uh, they they give um, Seth, and then so Seth fathers several folks leading up to to Enoch. Um, so yeah, I think by faith, right? Enoch believed um, and, and was found pleasing to God. Uh, by faith in whom, and that's the promised Messiah, right? The seed of the woman, uh, Jesus Christ, the fullness revealed in our, um, in God made flesh. So who is Enoch, right? We talked about this a little bit, right? He's a son of Jared, um, not Cain's son in Genesis 4, 17. Seventh in line to Adam. He's listed in the genealogy of Jesus from Joseph in Luke chapter 3. Um, he followed, fathered Methuselah, which is the oldest person, the longest per, the person to live the longest, recorded in Scripture. Um, and, and, of course, he lived 365 years. So he, he, uh, he lived for quite a while. Yeah. Um, pre, uh, Pre-flood. So in Genesis 5, it talks about Enoch walked with God. What does that really mean? Well, there's only two instances in Scripture. This is one of them. The other one is with Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, where it talks about this really a special relationship um, that explains the, the favor that God showed to these two men. So walking with God, Noah walked with God, Enoch walked with God. What that looks like in its fullness I'm not sure we could speculate, and there's lots of speculation in it. Um, but if we filter it through what we know in Hebrews chapter 11, walking by God is being righteous in the sight of the Lord, in the proclamation of the promised Messiah, especially in an increasingly wicked world, right, which we see up to the time of Noah, and God passes judgment with the flood. So if we look, we interpret the Old Testament through the New Testament, right, and what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us in the book of Hebrews. Um, yeah, it, Hebrews says, kind of lays it out in First Hebrews long ago and many times and, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but now in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created this world. So if you go Google online and you find all these people who uh, are self-proclaimed Bible scholars, um, the, the problem that, that occurs when people start saying crazy things or even new things, um, that they have this, you know, everyone got it wrong and I'm going to show you why, you know, um, or they start putting out things that God has not really commanded or different promises that God has not revealed to us or given to us, it's, you know, somebody's not interpreting the Old Testament through the New Testament. I think we talked about that in the Revelation or the end time stuff as well. Um, and so um, we're people of the New Testament. And so it's always important to view that as, as a lens. Um, Luther, so the top of page two, Luther writes quite extensively, and I have it right here, Luther's lectures on Genesis chapters one through five. And so Luther writes very extensively on um, Enoch. Some of it is speculation, right? And some of it is expounding upon um, what is revealed in the fullness of the context that's being shown. So Luther writes, and I have a quote from it here. This shows once more what it means to walk with God, namely to preach another life um, that is the, than this one to give instruction about the future seed, about the head of the serpent that will be crushed, about the kingdom of Satan that will be destroyed. This is what Enoch preached, who nevertheless was a husband and the head of a family, who had a wife and children and also ruled his household and supplied their food um, and his labor. So Luther includes that last part because again, the context for which he's writing, he's writing against things like monasticism and priests not being married and things like that. Um, but that, you know, uh, this is what made Enoch so righteous, um, and, uh, in his walk with God. 
So God took him up, right? It's a pretty unique phrase used in scripture. Uh, it's used first in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, right? The Lord God took uh, the man and um, put him in the Garden of Eden to keep it, uh, to work it and keep it. The Hebrew word there is lakak, is the uh, root word for it, right? It can also mean to receive to himself. So God received uh, Enoch to himself, which is important because we talk about, did Enoch go to heaven? God's receiving him in his presence. Um, just like the Lord God took the man and placed him, received him into the garden to work it. Um, and so the context there would be that he's with the Lord. And the Lord is in the heavens, right? Um, not to be confused with the sky where the birds are at or space where, you know, Elon Musk is at or something like that. So uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, that's what that LXX is there. The Greek word that's used is often translated as translated. So Enoch was translated um, and uh, to, to be with the Lord, right? Or God translated him. To me, that just makes it more confusing, to be honest with you. And, um, but I think it does give an indication that he did not die and that he was somehow transformed to be with the Lord, right? He's translated and he has to be um, translated because he's, he's still a sinful person, right? It's not like he was born without sin. And, but, you know, God is transforming him to be in his presence. Um, in the Lord's presence. Why? Because Enoch is trusting in the promised Messiah. It's by faith. So um, without trying to delve into some kind of works righteous thing of Enoch. But, you know, it, there's not a lot of information given there in Genesis chapter five. And so there's a lot of speculation that comes out of it. Um, and a lot of interest that happens um, in Enoch in later generations. And you can see that in the intertestamental period, which is what we just talked about a few minutes ago, where some writers used Enoch as a character in speculative works, and it's called the pseudepigrapha, right? So when you write in the pen of somebody else, it's you're, you're writing a pseudepigrapha. You're, you're pretending, for lack of a better term, to be that person writing the account of it. Um, that's what the first book of Enoch is. And that's what's in reference to in, in Jude 14 and, and 15. Um, and it's pretty widely known, right? So if you're, if you're a Jew or a God-fearer at the time that Jude is writing or at the time of Jesus, you know about the book of Enoch. I mean, it's pretty common knowledge. Um, and, uh, uh, but it's not accepted in Jewish canon. So the Jews did not include that in, let's say the Septuagint in their Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, and it wasn't accepted at the time of Christ to be a book that are part of the Hebrew scriptures. Um, it's just an additional book that again, does it convey truth in it? Yeah. Because Jude, through the Holy Spirit, attests to the truth that it conveys. But God did not select it or the church to be in the canon of Scripture, the things that we have in our Bible. So Jews at that time know that Enoch did not write that? Yes. Yep. They did. And, and the other books of Enoch, 2nd and 3rd Enoch, which we'll see, they weren't even around then. They didn't come much later. Um, and... Um, and again, uh, and I'll get into this. Well, I'll get into it. I don't want to. I don't want to jump ahead. So, in the apocrypha, right, excluding Enoch, um, in the apocrypha, like the one we have here in our Lutheran apocrypha, which again is not scripture, but still valuable in conveying some kind of truth. But but I wouldn't. You're not going to want to make Christian doctrine off of what's enclosed in the Apocrypha, because the church has not agreed that it is um, uh, the, the fullness of God's word revealed, 
right? And so the the reason, um, and the reason is a, is a bunch of things, but why some, we can talk about that at another Bible study, why some books are included in scripture and some books are not. Uh, but there was criteria. They didn't just randomly get it. Um, and, uh, and it makes sense. So in Ecclesiasticus, right, or the wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach, uh, it's an apocryphal text. It mentions Enoch uh, twice, and it goes through these lists of the patriarchs of the faith, just like Hebrews did. Um, it says, Enoch pleased the Lord and was taken up. He was an example of repentance to all generations. And uh, no one like Enoch had been created on earth, for he was taken up from the earth, and neither has been any man like Joseph. Even his bones were cared for, or Shem or Seth were honored among men, and Adam above every living being in the creation. And so again, um, these are books that are written pre-New Testament, um, and they're um, wisdom literature that's given um, in that intertestamental period. So it, it doesn't any it doesn't really contradict the things that we would present about Enoch in Scripture. I mean, he was someone who walked uh, with the Lord. He was a righteous man. Um, what did Jesus come proclaiming? What did John the Baptist come proclaiming? Right, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Found in whom? Found in the seed of the woman. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and again, Enoch was created on earth. He was taken up from the earth. So. The book of Enoch, right? There are actually three books. Uh, the second book of Enoch currently exists in the old church Slavic, which I'm sure we're all super familiar with. Um, so the Slavic Eastern European um, Orthodox Church, um, and it is attributed to anywhere between the first century BC, right? To the 10th century AD, right? So in other words, nobody knows. There's no way to lock it in as to who, who wrote it and when they wrote it, um, which is pretty common with a lot of books from the, 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 old, the ancient world. The third book of Enoch, right, um, is written very late, sixth or seventh century AD. Um, it's written in Hebrew um, in Babylon, right, and currently um, in Iraq. Um, and again, you can't lock in who wrote it. It's written as if it is Enoch. Um, and really, there isn't anything in those books that would say, wow, here's this great, you know, everything was a lie, and this is something, which is often what, like the Gnostic Gospels, when you talk about the Gospel of Thomas and some of these other ones, um, that reveal things that are not in keeping with Scripture, right? So again, if Scripture interprets Scripture, God is consistent with his message that he's uh, proclaiming to us. Um, he's not going to, like, give us some secret uh, knowledge out there that sort of opens our, our minds to something else. First Enoch, again, dates in this intertestamental period, probably no er earlier than the fourth century BC. Um, today, the fullness of the book of Enoch is uh, only found in um, Gies, right, which is the language of Ethiopia. Um, and translated from its Aramaic originals, so not even written in Hebrew. Um, and there were fragments, though, that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there were sections and fragments of the Book of Enoch that were discovered um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are in Aramaic. But the fullness of the whole book, the first Book of Enoch, is, is only found in the Ethiopian language and in the Ethiopian church. Um, so again, uh, why, you know, part of why, why wouldn't you include that in Holy Scripture um, is because it's not widely known or accepted throughout the church, which is really one of those criteria. Um, Pastor, I read the, uh, the Gospel of Thomas a yeah. lot of years ago, and I wanted to accept it in my, you know, in my mind. I wanted to accept it because there's a very simple message in the beginning mm -hmm. now i realize it completely undermines the church yeah and that message is that christ allegedly told them in this that where you don't need to worship in buildings of mortar right wherever i'm at wherever you overturn a, overturn a, overturn a stone or something. yeah and that's very dangerous because if you have people who are 
becoming believers and they're seeking, they need to be with other people in church. Right. Yeah. Not just worshiping under a tree somewhere because they don't under, you know, it seems like it would be the, the opposite of what we. What we yeah, I, I would argue that you you can, and this might be zesty here, you can't be a Christian and not be part of the church, right? Um, you can't have God as your father if the church is not your mother. We also need one another as brothers and sisters to tell one another about. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what God has designed it to be. I mean, he it is his will. And um, and again, what what prevails against the gates of hell, right? It's the church built on the confession of Jesus Christ. So, um, yeah, that's the rock. Yeah, so uh, on a side note, right, Book of Enoch, it's quoted in, in Jude 14, verses 14 and 15, um, but that doesn't really confirm that it's part of the Jewish or Christian canon. It's just widely known. And so Jude is making a point about false teachers that are coming, and he's using a widely known um, uh, reference uh, to help translate that or communicate that to um, those he's writing to, right? The same thing Christ did, same thing the apostles did um, in terms of telling that false teachers are going to arise. And, and there are actually lots of books referenced in scripture that we have no idea what they what they are right so I, I got a few examples here the book of jasser right which is mentioned in joshua 10 and, and mentioned actually in some other places nobody knows what that is uh the book of the wars of the lord which is mentioned in numbers 21 nobody knows what that is um the book of uh, uh shemaya the prophet in second chronicles the chronicles of king um asherus asherus um, is mentioned in Esther and Nehemiah, right? There's also a lost list, a lost epistle, sorry, letter uh, to the Corinthians. It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, so perhaps we would have had a third Corinthians at one point. But, um, but again, those are lost. They're lost for a reason. And, uh, and I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, if you feel stressed out about that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, now, some church fathers, right, and we talk about early church fathers, accepted First Enoch as biblical canon. Maybe, right? Uh, Tertullian did, and if you're familiar with Tertullian, I don't know if you call him a church father, I guess you could. He accepted, uh, he also said a bunch of other crazy things too. So again, when you read the church fathers, this is what we like to do. Lutherans, evangelicals, Roman Catholics, Orthodox, we like to go through what the church fathers have written throughout the centuries and cherry pick, just like we do with scripture, all these things out that support us, right? You know, I, I, I uh, interesting enough, and I have here, this is a very good book, Ancient Christian uh, Commentary on Scripture. Uh, the guy who was actually my mentor at the seminary is, is one of the editors of this. Um, and so, you know, whenever you read the church fathers, you always read it with a grain of salt, right? For one, they're writing in, in antiquity, in, in ancient times. So they write very, very differently than we do, right? They think really differently than we do. And so it's kind of hard to transpose that, to cram my sort of historical context and how I think into one that's just probably totally foreign, that all I have is sort of references that, you know, and again, some historical references, you know, you got to be discerning because sometimes they're not accurate, right? And so um, it's always important to read the church fathers, you know, in light of Holy Scripture. So again, maybe this is a big difference between us and Roman Catholics and maybe Eastern Orthodox is they would say, you know, they would use church fathers to build upon things that we believe. And those would be part of what the church the magisterium of the church, the ruling of the church is saying is true. And we would say, well, they say truths because they're expounding or um, explaining biblical truths, and those things are grounded in the Bible, right? Can the church fathers get stuff wrong? Yeah. Have they? Yeah. So, I mean, it's important to sort of look at that. Um, and I say all that because, um, you know, I saw on the, on the messenger, 
um, Eileen Googled, you know, Enoch and Elijah, and I did too. And uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff. And uh, so I just want to make sure, you know, people quoting Tertullian or Clement of Rome or Irenaeus, Irenaeus has a lot to write about, and I'll have an Irenaeus quote in here. Um, uh, but um, most of the church fathers rejected its use. And um, if you go to the top of, of uh, page three, the Venerable Bede, which I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with, uh, he's an eighth century. Um, I think this is the first time I've talked about the Venerable Bede in, at this church. At our previous church, I, we did a Bible study. It was like Venerable Bede every five minutes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Anyway, the venerable bead. Everyone is right, right. on edge to see. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tell us, tell us all about what did the venerable <laughs> bead say? No, um, he's a theologian uh, writing in the eighth century, right? So the seven hundreds ish. Um, he's um, English, right? So hurrah for him. And um, so he he wrote a very extensive thing about why it's not included in the canon, um, Enoch. But he does, and he, he makes these, you know, for one, he talks about, and I won't read the whole quote because it's rather long, but he says, we don't know who the author is, right? These are these requirements that we brought the biblical canon into. So we don't know who authored it, right? We know it's not Enoch. And if it is, we're talking about a pre-flood account from Enoch, right? After everything is destroyed and he's taken up. So it, it's such a long period of time that, um, you know, this is why God chose Moses to reveal these things that were happened in, in Genesis. And so, you know, we don't know that. And then... Um, this is one of those questions that I always, like, get annoyed with my students about, but what does venerable mean? Oh, it so means... Like, you're missing the point. What yeah, are you yeah. talking about? Uh, you venerable, is one of the, <laughs> <laughs> venerable is one of those things uh, that it's like, uh, you know... Maybe holy, righteous, commendable, maybe commendable, right? Yeah. Like honorable. Honorable, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and this is how in 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 ancient times, you know, in latter times, they they would, you know, they attach like a name like the great to somebody or the right, the holy. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think if I just said bead. I would probably, people would be, yeah. yeah. But anyway, so um, so the Venerable Bede makes this, you know, assessment about the Book of Enoch. Um, that's why it's not accepted. Augustine is the same way, right? Um, St. Augustine didn't accept Enoch as a part of scripture. Um, and, um, he, but the Venerable Bede does say that, you know, this passage with Jude takes from, from Enoch is not in itself, dubious or apocryphal, but it's rather notable for the clarity with which he testifies the true light. So in other words, he's trying to make a point and he's revealing a truth that people would widely know because he is a real person who's writing to real people, which is the beautiful thing about God's word coming to us. And so uh, he's trying to communicate that. So he doesn't say like, you know, he, Jude is not saying, hey, Enoch, that's a legitimate book. He's just saying, look, there's some truth in here. You guys know this story, and I'm going to use it to communicate to you, to provide clarity. If you don't know, have you read the book of Enoch? I'm not. Okay. John, you have, right? Yeah. So um, the book of Enoch, if you don't know it, to summarize it, it's really about God's judgment against evil, right? And, and what led to the flood. Um, so fallen angels, um, impregnating um, human women and making giants. Um, and that's where you get in Genesis chapter six, uh, the, Nep the Nephilim, right? So you don't really have an explanation of what that is and these giants on earth, right? Um, and so um, Enoch goes through and talks about uh, fallen angels. He calls them the watchers. Um, and there's also one that... Uh, that, that is reigns over them and these Nephilim and all this stuff like that, which leads to the judgment of the flood and everything. Um, it, I mean, it would make a great movie. It has. Right, yeah, <laughs> maybe that is. I don't know. I haven't seen the one with Russell Crowe. Yeah. Oh, there, yeah, there, yeah, the movie Noah with Russell Crowe. Does that have that in there? Oh, man, yeah, there are rock giants and there are Nephilim or, you know, the Morians or whatever. Right. 
but there are rock giants and helping them, you know, do things. And, and yeah. And it's in, it's convenient, you know. That's a very small part in our entire Bible about it. Yeah. The six Genesis six one through four, but it's the people who try to convince you that Enoch one is real. Right. As they go, well, this is the account. You know, if you look at Genesis six one through four, it talks about this, so that's it. And they try to tie it to the scripture because there's nothing else there or no one else from that time they can say that's not true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, church fathers, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very interesting, but again. I mean, this is not a matter of, of salvation. It's just an, an, an intrigue there. Um, I think the main point to take away from this, right, to take away from Enoch and what happens in Genesis chapter 5, it's, it's a foretaste of the good things to come by faith, right, that God saves by grace. You're saved through faith, which is not of your doing. Enoch didn't do this of his own, right? It's a gift of God. And so um, it's a... And this is what Luther focuses on too. That's it's this sig significant act that the human race is not condemned to death on the account of sin, and yet there's you know, it's hope of life and immortality um, that we won't abide in death forever, right? So death is continuing on. It's being introduced into the world because of the sin of Adam, and so God is giving this sort of hope. Um, and this glorious message um, in, uh, in Enoch, right? Luther writes on the assumption of Enoch, uh, and this is a great quote from Luther, this is the rule that the cross and affliction always precede comfort. God does not comfort any unless they are sad, just as he does not give life to any unless they are dead and does not declare any righteous unless they are sinners, for he creates everything out of nothing. And he, he puts that to kind of summarize the hope that's found in, in Genesis chapter 5, and we get that um, a brief verse about Enoch. So God is putting a testimony, an, an, an objective lesson, right, a, a real physical lesson in Enoch to prepare us for that there is a life to come um, and that we shall live with God forever. Um, and I think that's the main sort of thing you can draw out of of Enoch. Now, before I run out of time, Elijah, right? Uh, what does scripture tell about him? A whole bunch of stuff, and I'll go into that just as a reminder um, of who Elijah was. But the part we're talking about is in 2 Kings chapter 2. Uh, two Bible studies for Enoch. I know. And as they went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Um, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more, right? So just a quick reminder of who Elijah is. Prophet, his name means um, God is Yahweh the Lord. Um, he prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, primarily during the reign of Ahab. This was actually the Old Testament reading for this past Sunday, um, when Elijah was running um, from Ahab at Jezebel, all right? Ahab's influenced by his pagan wife Jezebel. It's the worship of uh, Baal, or if you want to English mispronounce it, Baal. And, um, uh, you know, Jezebel's trying to get rid of the worship of, of Yahweh. So Elijah's <laughs> called to denounce it. Um, he, actually, he actually kills quite a few of the prophets of Baal. Um, He's this very forerunner of John the Baptist figure, right? Which John the Baptist fulfills his prophetic ministry and Elijah to fulfill the scriptures. And so Elijah's, uh, he's an imposing figure. He dresses in a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt. Um, lots of miracles, raising from the dead, um, a long affected drought on Israel. And, you know, he's, he's sent up in the face of his successor, Elisha, uh, while they looked on. So, and again, John the Baptist, if you didn't know this, fulfills the prophetic ministry of, of, uh, of Elijah that Malachi prophesied would come before the return of the Messiah. So, chariots of fire, horses of fire, right? And Elijah going up at a whirlwind into heaven. This Old Testament reading... Uh, the ascension of Elijah is actually read as the 
Old Testament reading for the ascension of our Lord um, on the feast day for that. So there, there is an indication that there's a connection, a prefiguring of um, Christ, and even a prefiguring of us, which Christ is the first fruits of salvation. Chariots of fire, horses of fire, right? It's either a vision or angels, and um, angels can appear as animals, right? And you see that in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse uh, 10, where angels appear to Ezekiel as the likeness of their faces. Each had a human face. The four uh, had the face of a lion on the right side, and the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had a face of an eagle. So again, angels can take a form that would represent um, animals as well. Um, but it could be just a vision because Elijah sees the same thing later on in 2 Kings chapter 6 when he um, sees the mountains around Samaria and he sees it's full of uh, horses and chariots of fire, right? The, the, the armies of the Lord are represented there. This visible power and, and protection of the Lord is being put forth to Elisha um, in a vision. So, and again, he is the Lord God of hosts, the Lord God of Sabaoth. So um, it's fitting. Went up in a whirlwind into heaven, right? Uh, I, I would say this is a very uh, prefigured reference to 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, chapter, or 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, right? Where the saints of God, all of us, and those who by faith in Christ or reside bodily with God in his presence, right? That's the plan that God has for us. Um, plus, I mean, it's right happening right in front of Elisha. So it's teaching him this promise. Um, and uh, he's going to proclaim that promise in his prophetic ministry as well. Um, whirlwind, right? I don't know if you know anything about the Middle East, but there ain't a whole lot of tornadoes. Um, at least in Israel, in that part. Um, but uh, maybe a better translation or just as good would be a strong wind, which is, the Lord has used that before as well, a strong wind. He's actually used a strong wind with um, Elijah, and that was the Old Testament reading from this past Sunday, where Elijah's hiding in a cave on Mount Sinai, and a strong wind comes and wrecks up the place. Um, heavens, right? So you, I think the, a good point to, to, to make is that if you, if you Google online, there's a lot of people say that they didn't go to he the heaven. So Elijah didn't go to heaven and neither did, um, especially Enoch, because it doesn't explicitly say that, um, or that they, if it does say for Elijah that he went to heavens, they're saying it's um, the heavens that is the first heavens, which is like you know, up in the sky, and that God transported Elijah to some place where he's waiting for the resurrection and the, the return of the Lord and all this stuff. Um, that seems like a stretch to me. And, and I would say, you know, Hashemayim is the Hebrew word for the heavens, right? It's used all over the place. There's a definite article, the is attached to it. Um, Hashem mean God. Hmm? Hashem is that God. What is Hashim? I don't know. Oh, the oh, sorry, they said Hashim. Uh, Shemayim. Shemayim. Yeah. Yeah. So ha ha the Shemayim heavens. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, but again, context is king. If you look at the very beginning of chapter two, um, it says, and now when the Lord was about to take up Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind. Um, Elijah and Elisha uh, were on their way from Gilgal, right? The context and the grammatical use of this is the same that occurs in, in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Job, uh, Psalm 50, uh, Psalm 97, Psalm 89, Psalm 148. Um, and it, it actually means heaven, right? With God, the abode of God, not just air or space. Um, so uh, Elijah's not floating around in some untrackable radar location here on earth. Um, and he's not, you know, he didn't get in a spaceship and fly off somewhere, uh, which I guess if you watch the History Channel, Ancient Aliens, you would probably think that as, as well. But um, so, yeah, it actually means heaven, right, where God is located. And again, um, 
you know, this is where context and gr grammar really come in handy in trying to um, reveal um, <laughs> what God is saying in his word. So a problem text that comes up that some people say is a proof text to show that there's a contradiction in the Bible. Jesus, when he's having this discussion with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descends from heaven, the Son of Man. And so uh, this is where a lot of people try to either disprove that Enoch or Elijah went to heaven um, or that uh, uh, or they they're you know not the the heaven that is the abode of God or that um, uh, that there's a contradiction in scripture that that you know it's not accurate but uh, again context is really the king here so Jesus is making an emphatic statement that no one has ever ascended to heaven with the exception to one who has descended that's him but if you read it in the whole chapter and the other passages around it, he's giving it in reference to the bronze serpent that's lifted up, right? And so he's referencing Numbers 21. And because you remember those, you know, God's people in the wilderness, they're being naughty like they always are. So he sends fiery serpents to bite them and kill them, right? And so then they, they repent, they lift up this bronze serpent that he gives. Um, and those who look upon it are saved. And so Jesus is talking about the one who's lifted up from the dead and therefore ascended into heaven, right? Who's saving his people and being uh, the first fruits of salvation, ascending to God the Father. So it's unlike Elijah and Enoch, right? Who never died, right? Um, they, they didn't have to be lifted up from the dead. They never died to begin with. Um, and so really the, the point here in John chapter three is, is um, not only the physical ascension of the body of Jesus into heaven, but also that um, someone whose life is eternal that comes down from heaven and is incarnate made flesh dies, right? Death and the bronze serpent lifted up. Uh, the son of man is lifted up. The body of Jesus is killed right? Um, and then there is a reuniting of a glorified body uh, physically in order to ascend back into heaven. So, yeah, I mean, this, I don't know if you thought about that or if you thought that much about uh, John chapter three, but it is a proof text that people use to, to kind of figure out, um, to either see a contradiction in scripture or that, you know, Enoch and Elijah didn't go to heaven because that would contradict Jesus's words. But given the context of it, you know, he's talking about the first human. He's not talking about those who were the first to get to heaven or even the people who were raised from the dead, because there were lots of folks raised to the dead up until that point. You know, even Elijah did that. Right. He, he's talking about the first born from the dead um, who saves. Right. Um, and uh, who saved himself. Um, and uh, and rose from the dead. So, and that's what Paul talks about, top of chapter five, I mean, of page five in 1 Corinthians 15, right? Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Um, so, uh, there is a question of whether Enoch and Elijah are the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. And John and I talked a little bit about this before the Bible study began. Um, and I don't know if you've heard this before, that, that they were the two witnesses that, well, I'll read the scripture. Revelation chapter 11, then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for uh, 1,260 days clothed in sac sackcloth. So who is that? I don't know. Of, I don't know. To be honest with you. <laughs> who are the two witnesses? I think there's a lot of speculation about it, but it's not really clear who that is. Um, Whoever they are, they belong to God, right? They're my witnesses. They belong to God the Father or, or uh, um, our Lord Jesus. 
uh, by that possessive pronoun there. Uh, church fathers, again, have made some speculation, um, and you've got two there, um, who from the sixth century in, the, in their Greek commentaries had said it was either Enoch or Elijah, because again, um, Elijah is prophesied to come, and so maybe the fullness of that coming is in Revelation as well. Um, and Enoch uh, was translated, right, or uh, taken to the Lord um, and didn't see death. And so um, could it be them? Sure. Um, I don't know if I'm reading that correctly. Um, in Revelation chapter 11, I would say, like, if you wanted to hold a gun to my head and say, pick biblical figures that are those two witnesses, I would probably say that it, it was Moses and Elijah, because they appear to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, they symbolize these two witnesses of the law and the prophets that testify to Jesus Christ, which is required by God's law in Deuteronomy chapter 19, um, in order to give a, a witness um, of something. So I would say that makes more sense than Enoch and Elijah. Could it be Enoch and Elijah? I don't know. We'll know at the last day. Um, I've, so, seen, I've seen people tie Islam together with this by saying that the body, because right. in Islam they believe the body of Jesus will return. Mm -hmm. I've seen people co opt this and say, oh, well, that's what they were talking about. Yeah. You know, so it's, yeah. I mean, um, in the Quran, it, it makes references to stuff. I, there's some Islamic thought on Enoch as well. Um, but of course, the Jesus that returns in the Quran, I would say, is the Antichrist. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, what does it all mean? I'll try to tie it in. Um, Irenaeus does a really good job. For Enoch, when he pleased God, was translated in the same body in which he did please him thus pointing out by anticipation the translation of the just, right? Elijah too was caught up when he was yet in substance of a natural form, thus exhibiting in prophecy the assumption of those who are spiritual, uh, but that those who are found in Christ, that nothing stood in the way of their body being translated and caught up. For by means of the very same hands through which they were molded in the beginning, did they receive this translation and assumption, right? So why, why uh, what's the point of all this? God is giving you an assurance that there is something to come, right? A life to come and that he will raise you on the last day. I think that makes a lot of sense because it ties two bookends really well in the beginning with Enoch and in the end on the last day. Um, Augustine makes this, uh, talks about this a little bit in his um, Psalm 129 exposition. Um, he's looking at verse, verse one, Oh, you know the reason why it says Psalm 129 and then Psalm 128? Because when you look at the Hebrew, the Psalm numbers are off from what Psalm numbers we have in English. So he's really talking about in the Hebrew, Psalm 128, verse 1. Many a time have they fought against me from my youth up. And he's saying the church speaks of those whom she endures as if they were asked. Um, is it now the churches of ancient birth, since saints have been so called, the church has been on earth? At one time, the church was in Abel only. Are right? you talking about those who are in the faith are the church, right? The assembly, the people of God. Um, and he fought against his wicked and lost uh, brother Cain. Um, and then uh, at one time, the church was in Enoch alone. He was translated from the unrighteous. Um, so again, he walked with God. He's given this distinction in scripture uh, that the Holy Spirit reveals to Moses. And so... Um, what, what can you pull from that is that uh, uh, God takes care of his children. Um, so possibly it's a foretaste of the resurrection and the glorification on the last day. And we have that verse uh, to the passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where you know, the, the Lord will descend from heaven, the loud cry and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. Um, and those who are dead in Christ will arise and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, and so we will always be with the Lord. And um, this is what Luther says as well. Uh, 
Thus, even on the first world, so he's talking about the world before the flood, God desired to have a clear example to prove that he had prepared for his saints another life after this life. In it, they would live with God. Thus, they would have in their possession the comfort and the promise of eternal life, not only in the form of a word, but also in the form of an actual deed, just as he previously had done in the instance with Abel, right? Abel died, Adam is given another uh, son, Seth. So again, it, it's designed to give us comfort and assurance that the Lord is taking care of us, um, that he has something more than this life, heavenly treasures um, that are stored up in Christ. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we can have assurance and comfort, e even if, even if we don't know, you know, what Enoch actually did, um, or we don't know what the, the Nephilim are, um, per se. Um, you know, some things the Lord doesn't want us to know, but he certainly gives us what we need to know in his word. And Paul makes that clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, right? He's the God of comfort and mercies, who comforts us in all of our afflictions, um, so that we ourselves are comforted by God. Any questions? Yeah, so I mean, um, liner, but maybe more confusing. It's a lot of stuff to go. I think it's, I mean, yeah. As a person who's thought about it a bunch, I mean, I, I've just thought about it quite a bit and I've read a lot about it and don't understand it very much, but this helps. This is a little bit better. It's kind of a, I always remember one thing that Pastor McGay told me. He said that um, go to meet the Lord and say, I am with the child. Yeah, and so because children are fools, right? And so I think it it it's a comforting, and like you said, you know, that it's basically just evidence that God has a problem, that God's promise is good. That, that's a good thing. Yeah, you don't have to dwell on it too much. Figure out who they are. No, I agree. Um, so I mean, it is fun to speculate, and and you know, there's a bit, and and honestly, there are a lot of sources out there that are throwing lots of this stuff out there right, right. now. I heard somebody that was throwing Kabbalah out there the other day on a regular major broadcast. They were talking about uh, Lilith the right. first. And I was thinking, these people are broadcasting this to millions and millions of millions of people. And because it's comfortable for them, it's easier, they're going to believe it. Yeah. And so, and so there are a lot, there's a lot of false stuff out there. It's easy to trick people who don't. And I was tricked when I first read Enoch years ago. Yeah. And thinking, ah, oh, here it is. It's not like that. That's the same as the Garden of Eden, the tree of forbidden knowledge. Yeah. Uh, truth matters. And um, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, God gives us his truth and his word. He calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. And so, um, you know, I, the devil loves to intermingle truth with a lie. And I think they, you know, that can happen with some of these other things. Um, and a good, it's it's never good to build, you talk about apocryphal things, it's never good to build doctrine, Christian doctrine from that. Um, and uh, some other churches may do that. The Roman church does, especially when things like prayers for the dead and um, masses or atonement for those who have died. That's something that they pull primarily out of. Um, uh, yeah, first. Well, yeah, actually, that's a good thing about Lawrence. Uh, Romans, the Roman Catholics pull it out of um, Maccabees. Uh, when you talk about Judas Maccabeus makes a prayer for the right to, for, to, to justify those who had died. Um, and again, you don't want to be building all of your doctrine off of stuff that's questionable of whether it should be in the canon of scripture um, or that's a hidden thing, too. Interesting enough about the Mormons, uh, the Mormons quote um, the Book of Enoch pretty regularly. I don't think they include it in their uh, scripture, but they include, what is it called? The Book of Moses, um, which is an apocryphal book to attributed to Moses. Um, and so uh, it's never recommended to copy anything the Mormons do. So, <laughs> yes. And then go grab your lunch. And okay. Hi, Eileen. When you looked at uh, the two witnesses, yeah, we talked about revelations being literal or, or 
Todd Little. Yeah. So, and we talk about the two, the two uh, witnesses, and then the forty-two months and days. Is this all figurative? Then, I, I mean, are we is this uh, numbers being symbols? Yeah, I I would say so. I mean, um, so, so in that regards, I mean, could it be? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say the very beginning when you talk about measuring a rod like a staff and was told to rise and measure the temple of God, where is the temple of God? It's it's us, right? And so the, the temple is no more. And right. so it's a comfort thing to show the the uh, those who are in the church, those who are uh, where the Holy Spirit dwells in. And so I would say it's it's we're talking figurative stuff here. If if we if we take the uh, with the witnesses, are they figurative? They could be, you know. Uh, are they a testimony to, you know, the law and the prop? That's why I would think it's the law and the prophets. They give testimony uh, to the uh, uh, to the judgment. Um, there's also a bunch of stuff in Zechariah that you can actually pull out that talk about um, the lampstands and the olive trees that are here in in chapter 11. Um, that he gives reference to. So, I mean, um, so like 42 months and 1260 days, those are just symbols of a certain amount of time. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah. Um, and you also, know, I'd, I'd have to look up exactly what they're going to symbolize because I don't think those we numbers can... aren't, you know, like 10 or 1,000 or I know. 12, you know, they're, yeah. they're different numbers. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. Um, but I, I mean, I would say, th could they, be, could they be, you know, maybe, but I, I would say what's giving, I mean, if he starts out in this revelation that, that he's not measuring the actual literal temple because there is no temple anymore, then the whole thing probably that, that proceeds after that is a sort of fi figurative explanation right. of it as well. Okay. So that's why I've always thought. Yeah. I just want to clarify. Yeah. But as far as 42 months and, and 1260, I'd, I'd have to think about that one um, and maybe do some research to find out exactly what maybe what that would be pointing to, because I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think, I mean, I would be surprised if it was Enoch and Elijah that the Lord, those two witnesses, I mean, I guess. Yeah, we're I mean, gonna... yeah how could you leave Moses out? Yeah, I can see Moses and Elijah. Right. Well, I mean, yeah. Moses out of that? But I, but I think what they were, was what we talked about before. I think if you're, if you're reading the Book of Enoch, then you know that Enoch is one who's, you know, speaking judgment, and so um, perhaps that's what's going on here too. Well, let, let's close with a word of prayer. So we're over our time. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you give us assurance and confidence in our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to this world incarnate, descended from heaven, and lived a righteous and perfect life, died for our sins, and raised in the last day, ascended to your right hand, and is the first fruits of salvation that has come to us, promised to us, given to us in Jesus. Lord, bless us always in this assurance and comfort in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, it's fun. It's not as heavy 